for today's episode, you might want to buy a vowel. Hi everyone, welcome to Talk and Chalk. This is my latest video in the pre-service teachers series, PST. I think we've come up with so many different names now from all the different systems. I wonder where that happened. Why do we suddenly just had all these different names for them? That's okay, we're gonna get into it anyway. If you're interested in following me on any of my other social media, links are all in the description below. So if you're an Instagram person or a Twitter person, it's all education related. I don't spam, I don't sell anything. I don't have time, I did these videos. So today's video I'm going to be talking about the different jobs slash roles that you'll find within a school. And the reason I'm gonna tell you is because we all talk in acronyms. Initials, we don't usually say the whole words all the time. We've got just shortened versions of it. And that can be quite daunting and a bit confusing for someone who's stepping into a school for the very first time, or even if it's been a couple of times and you're still not sure what those jobs are. Hopefully I can break it down for you today. So this should be a nice quick one. So going a bit old school, I got my chalkboard out. Letters, like I said, by vowel. So what I'm going to do is just go through each of these and kind of what they mean and what they do and how it can differ from school to school. Keeping in mind, I'm in the public system and I'm in New South Wales, so that's where my knowledge and experience comes from. I do have friends in other systems, so I know that these are slightly different in other systems. However, the general hierarchy is kind of the same. So in your school system, you'll have a principal. Uh, some schools have a teaching principal if it's a small country school. Um, <clears throat> some schools have co-principals depending on what the setup is, if it's a large school or if the principal is on part-time for whatever reason, um, but ultimately that's where the principal sits. Above the principal is the director, that's a whole other hierarchy of its own and those positions have been sort of reformed recently. So I'm not going to touch on that, but just so you know, you know, the principal isn't where the buck stops. They have bosses too and they have accountability and reports and things that they have to, to do as well. So sitting directly below the principal is the deputy principal. Not all schools will have a deputy principal. I think the magic number is just over 500. If you've got um, steady enrollments above 500 or 550, um, then you'll get allocated a deputy principal. If your numbers are much higher than that, and don't hold me to this, but I think the magic number is 1,000 or 1,100, you could have two deputy principals. Um, and again, those roles and responsibilities can change from school to school. And it depends on how large a school is, the structure that you've got, what role that deputy might play. They might have a deputy for infants, deputy for primary, a deputy for all of them. Or if your school is a smaller size school, you won't have a deputy at all. Which means that the people below kind of have to take on those roles and responsibilities. The deputy often will do things like, you know, the timetables, allocations, some budgeting. Um, they might be the ones that sort of handle behavior management, um, collaborating with parents, and they'll have various roles and responsibilities. Um, they might have a partial teaching load, depending on the system. Uh, in central schools, deputy principals still exist there as well. And um, some I know have teaching responsibilities as well. So kind of sitting in line with the deputy principal, is what we call an instructional leader. This is a deputy principal level position. It's just not a permanent position. These are contracted positions. Some of the positions are allocated if you are an early action for success school. Um, so that's part of the literacy and numeracy strategy. And some schools choose to employ their own. So you get uh, funded for a certain amount, depending on your school and levels and sizes and everything. And you can choose obviously to employ your own and how you're going to utilize that. So some schools I know that have to have an instructional, uh, sorry, an instructional leader for literacy and an instructional leader for numeracy. Other schools have gone a different way and they've got an instructional leader, literacy, numeracy for infants and an instructional leader, literacy, numeracy for primary. Some will just have one instructional leader, K to three now that it's in year three for literacy and numeracy and some will employ it for K to six. Um, it, it needs to be based on student need and that's really what drives the instructional leader position um, and because it's part of the literacy and numeracy strategy it needs to focus on those student results and making sure students aren't falling behind. Sitting underneath these um, are the assistant principals and if you're in a secondary school the equivalent is a head teacher. 
Now, again, this comes down to the structure of your school, the needs of your school, how you want to do this. So some people might have a, an assistant principal on class. Um, others might have an assistant principal off class, which is what I'm doing at the moment. And they can be utilised in different ways. So schools that I've been at, the assistant principals are usually the supervisor for particular grades or stages. So like if it was three like this, you would probably have an assistant principal for early stage one and stage one, stage two, and then stage three. You could choose to break it up in different ways. So one might be a focus on um, K to six, if you're small enough. One might have a complete focus on uh, mentoring and instructional leadership, um, you know, doing dem lessons, that sort of a thing. One might be completely behavior, depending on the school system that you're in. In the head teacher system, though, in the secondary system, sorry, if you're a head teacher, generally that's faculty based. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you stay stringently based on one area. So just because you're a maths um, head teacher, depending on the size of your school, you could be the head teacher for maths and science. Um, bigger schools obviously stick with their faculty, um, their curriculum, and you can have head teachers for other things as well, like learning and wellbeing. And um, again, sizes of schools, funding, etc. Underneath them sit all of our classroom teachers, high school, primary school, support school, special school, doesn't matter. These are all the lovely other acronyms that you find sitting in our school. So an SLSO is a school learning support officer. So back in the day, you would call them a teacher's aide. So this is someone who provides support to students in the school and it could be for students who are, uh, generate funding. So they might have special needs and need someone with them for a certain period of time throughout the day. Um, the school can choose to employ their own SLSOs for various support needs as well. Um, SLSOs obviously come with an amazing amount of skills and expertise and I have never ever come across an SLSO that does not go above and beyond their job. I personally think they're very underpaid because um, they're amazing people. Uh, cannot be left alone in a classroom, you know, with students um, because it, same thing for um, prac teachers. Um, those qualifications haven't been met which don't meet the criteria for being um, alone in a class of students or alone one-to-one -one with a student without teacher nearby for supervision. EALD, so this is English as an additional language or dialect. Uh, some systems still say ESL, uh, English as a second language, um, or Labote language background other than English. EALD though um, is a classroom teacher. They're a qualified teacher with a degree in education. Um, they can take classes on their own, but ultimately they're providing support for students who might be new arrivals to the country or who do have English as an additional dialect. Um, and again, based on student need really, how that can happen. Um, a last, there's a terrible acronym that they came up with for this one. So this is the learning and support teacher. So for those of you who have been in the system a little while, you might remember these positions came out of um, some jobs I guess that were at district where they used to provide support to various schools. They were then sent back into schools with the idea being that they could um, be in classrooms with students, with teachers and upskilling teachers. And it comes in various forms. It could be behavior management. It could be special needs. It could be um, curriculum knowledge. Um, but ultimately the last teacher is someone who will help um, you create plans for students that have additional learning needs to um, build teacher capacity in terms of catering and differentiating for those students that have higher needs in the classroom as well. They're a great asset. The AEO, an Aboriginal Education Officer, not all schools have one. Depends on what school you're in, what your location is, what your Aboriginal enrolments are, um, the connection that you might have to the AECG as well. Um, but they are there to support obviously Aboriginal students and the Aboriginal learning that goes on in your school. The CLO is a community liaison officer, again, someone who the school chooses to employ and it's up to them how they utilize them, but ultimately they're your contact to the school. So if you need someone to, you know, source parents from the community or if they want to run volunteer programs or if you've got a PNC, that's your go-to between them. Um, the GA is the general assistant. So that's the, I don't think I've ever worked with a GA that was female. I don't know how many are out there. I'm sure they are. Um, the ones that I've worked with though, are absolutely wonderful. We'll always bend over backwards for you. That's the person you go to when you know a doorknob is broken or a window's been broken or they usually you know take care of maintenance of the um, 
the landscaping and um, repairs and upkeep and things like that. Uh, RFF, this is release from face to face. So this is when you get relieved from class time and this is not time, it's not personal time to go and do things. This is still class, uh, sorry, this is still school time, but it's time away from your class to be able to do things like attend meetings, to meet with the school counsellor, to um, put programming into place, to do any kind of assessing. It could be to meet with your supervisor, your instructional leader, um, to go through any kind of targeted intervention, to look at results, to do reporting. There's various ways that you can use it. Ultimately, it just means that you're off class. But the teacher who replaces them is still a qualified teacher. Same as any of the teachers down here, same as EALD. Um, the RFF teacher is a teacher who comes in and will teach those programs. So they might come in and teach science or music or drama or maths or whatever is negotiated. There are some schools that um, have community languages. So the community languages teachers take them for that RFF time. And then down the bottom, I've got some of the office roles. So schools might have a business manager. And then we've got um, the school administration or administrative manager for so the office manager um, and then officer so the school administrative office officer it's close to the end of the night and I'm tired <laughs> um, and then we have a school counselor and down here I've put what we call the his low the homeschool liaison officer so when attendance is low and we're concerned about the attendance of a student we the his low generates a report uh, depending on the um, severity of it. It's usually every two weeks. Sometimes it can be every week um, and they are the contact. So if legal um, implications coming up about a student with attendance and, and you know letters need to be generated and things like that, the HISLO is the person that will do that um, and that's the person that you need to work with to make sure that you put plans in place to support students actually getting to school on time and being there regularly. So that's a general overview of um, well, mainly a primary school. Obviously, high schools might look a bit different with what's on there. Um, but that's basically what you'll see in there. And I guess that hierarchy of what's going on and who you can go to for support and help. And, um, you know, everyone has their own coordinator roles and roles and responsibilities. And they can vary from school to school depending on the structure that you've got and the values that your school has and what um, programs and initiatives you're putting into place. So hopefully that's helped out, though give you a few more letters to add to your alphabet there. Um, so if there's any that I forgot, please put it in the comments below so that anyone who's looking at this can have a look and see any that I've missed. Um, if you still have questions about it, please feel free to contact me either on um, you know social media. Facebook is the, the good one on the Talk and Chalk page. I always answer any questions. There's no stupid questions at all. Um, if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, I'll put my button there. You just hover over that and click to subscribe. I'll put another one of my videos at the top there that might help you with some of the practices that uh, are going on in the classroom. And please feel free to message me if you have any suggestions for future PST videos. Thanks guys. Bye.